Hello, my name is Alexis Grant. I'm a doctoral student in Community Health Sciences here at UIC, and I'm also the Fellow for Community Engagement at the newly formed Collaboratory for Health Justice. And today I'm going to be talking about schools of public health as part of a larger system and part of a public health system. So in this lecture today, I'm going to give a history, a brief history of schools of public health, talk about schools of public health as research institutions, and then I'll move to talking about the importance and impact of trust in research. And lastly, I'll move to introducing the Collaboratory for Health Justice and how we hope to increase the capacity of, of the UIC School of Public Health to do the things that we'll be talking about in this lecture today. So first, we're going to do a brief history of schools of public health. And I just want to highlight that the history that we're going through is specifically about schools of public health and not public health broadly. And I do have some references at the end uh, if you're interested in public health more broadly in the history of public health in the United States. So the history of schools of public health really starts in 1910 with the publication of the Flexner Report. Abraham Flexner was a member of the General Education Board of the Rockefeller Foundation and this report was an assessment of different schools that provide medical training. The report really created a gold standard of medical training, which impacts medical school structure to this day. In 1912 was the establishment of the U.S. Public Health Service, which grew from the Public Health and Marine Hospital Services. And the U.S. Public Health Service was authorized to investigate human diseases like tuberculosis, um, hookworm, and also respond to sanitation, water supply, and sewage disposal. On October 16th, 1914, there was a meeting with the General Education Board of the Rockefeller Foundation that included 11 public health representatives and nine trustees, including Milton Rosno, Welch and Rose, uh, which wrote the Welch Rose Report, we'll talk about shortly, and also Abraham Flexner. At this meeting, they discussed the need for public health training programs, and Welch and Rose were asked to work out a plan for a new school that envisioned public health faculty independent of other university faculties, but still had close ties to medicine, dentistry, engineering, law, and had connections to hospitals, departments of health, and federal public health service. So arising from this meeting was the publication of the Welch Rose Report. And this report became a template for public health professional education in the United States and abroad. In the report, Welch and Rose advocated for courses and degrees in public health. And based on the Welch Rose Report's recommendations, the Rockefeller Foundation awarded a grant to Johns Hopkins University, which was founded in 1916, which is the first independent graduate school of public health, with Welch serving as the founding dean. At the same time were other notable publications, including that of Milton Rosno. His article was named Courses and Degrees in Public Health Work, and it emphasized practical instruction in public health. For example, a one-year certificate required to do a sanitary survey of a town. So with the founding of these first schools of public health and these thoughts around what it looked like to teach public health, there was a lot of value in how public health differed from traditional medical training programs. In 1918, with the influenza pandemic, which caused 25 to 50 million deaths worldwide, the importance of public health was emphasized in many different ways. And then in 1935, the passage of the Social Security Act increased funding for public health service and provided federal grants to states to assist them in developing public health services. Previously, a lot of the funding from public health were from private foundations. The Social Security Act also required states to establish minimal qualifications for health personnel employed using federal assistance and recommended at least one year of graduate education in an approved school of public health. So states initially budgeted for 1,500 public health trainees, and these programs were quickly filled to capacity. One thing I would like to note here is that during this time, there were two camps of the approaches to public health schooling. The British approach had an emphasis on public health administration and emphasized implementing interventions in sanitation, clean water, infectious disease control. And the research conducted at governmental or independent institutions is what this camp primarily advocated for. 
In contrast, a German approach suggested that departments or institutes should be university-based and that science should be advanced by research within a university setting. So even to this day, we can kind of see how these different approaches are seen throughout the ways that schools of public health are structured and function today. So between the passage of the Social Security Act and today, there have been a lot of different changes. In 1936, just 10 schools offered public health degrees or certificates that required at least one year of residence. Today, that number has risen to over 200. In 1938, only 4,000 people received public health training with federal funds. And the approaches of these programs are very different. Many of the programs were community-based to meet the, the demands of the public health system. And the emphasis of these programs was for people to understand practical public health issues rather than be scientific specialists. So many programs in the 30s integrated field training. In 1941, the Association of Schools of Public Health was founded to promote and improve graduate education for public health professionals. This is the first accrediting body for public health education. In 1946, the Committee on Professional Education of the American Public Health Association began monitoring standards for public health education amidst a bunch of schools offering public health degrees but having just a few faculty and having very low standards. During this time, lack of funding was an issue. Schools of Public Health competed with medical schools for federal funding, and many of the core funders for public health were turning to build departments of preventative medicine and community medicine within middle, medical schools rather than funding schools of public health. So as a result, schools turned to research funding to pay faculty salaries, which, if they were well-funded, led to larger departments. And because research funding was not directed towards field research, there was more emphasis on lab science rather than practice, and non-quantitative disciplines, which we can still see today. In the 1950s, federal grants to states and public health declined, and between 1947 and 1957, the number of students educated in schools of public health was halved. In 1958, Congress passed a two-year emergency program authorizing $1 million a year in federal grants to accredited schools of public health, which was a policy push that was supported and advocated for by ASPH. And then throughout the 60s and 70s, there was an increase of public health professional jobs and the federal funding for training in public health continued to increase. Again, into the 1980s and early 2000s, there was another decrease in funding for public health programs and projects. So throughout the history of public health education and schools of public health, there's been a varying flow of federal dollars specifically for schools of public health. And to this day, it's sometimes difficult to find funding sources that specifically relate to public health and don't require competition with other schools or disciplines. In 1998, the Institute of Medicine report entitled The Future of Public Health described the field of public health as being in disarray. The Future of Public Health report has several recommendations for schools of public health to improve their programming. The first recommendation was that new linkages between public health schools and programs should be established and public health agencies should be present at federal, state, and local levels. The second recommendation was that there be a development of new training opportunities for professionals who are already practicing in public health. Today, we would call this technical assistance or continuing education. The third recommendation was the development of new relationships within universities between public health schools and programs and other professional schools and departments. This is very important to collaboration and making sure that we have a broad framework in the work that we do. The fourth recommendation was to conduct a wide range of research that includes both basic and applied research and also conducting research on program evaluation and implementation. As some of you may know, this is a challenge even to this day over two decades later. The fifth recommendation was that there be a more extensive approach to education that encompasses the full scope of public health practice. Again, this is another challenge that we continue to fight with to this day. Lastly, another recommendation was that schools of public health need to strengthen the knowledge base in areas of international health and the health of minority groups. 
we have seen a lot of advancement in the, with different concentrations and global health and ever growing emphasis on health disparities and health equity. There's a lot of literature that provides recommendations and guidelines for what schools of public health should be moving towards now. These recommendations come from one of the articles assigned for reading this week, Greenberg 2013. First, they say that schools of public health need to approach funding organizations and make a case for the future. There are some organizations that do specifically fund public health education and training in broader social determinants of health, such as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The author of this article argues that schools of public health should seek out these kind of funding sources more often, and then also approach funding organizations that maybe aren't doing this kind of funding and push them towards providing more funding for addressing socioeconomic factors and the more social and structural determinants of health located at the lower level of this pyramid. Second, Greenberg says that public health organizations should approach national and international organizations like the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, etc., to support their efforts in addressing the social and structural determinants of health. This is something that is increasingly happening more, but could be done more often. Some of these organizations actually do offer training and fellowship opportunities to better partner with schools of public health and public health education. Third, Greenberg suggests that curriculum should highlight the epidemic of chronic disease specifically, and faculties across disciplines can participate in public health education. In order to address chronic disease like obesity, hypertension, uh, stroke, cancer, these kind of diseases, there needs to be a more collaborative approach from different disciplines that can participate in public health education and practice. I think this is somewhat revolutionary because traditionally public health professionals have been involved in clinical practice and this recommendation suggests that faculties across various disciplines, including medical disciplines, but also disciplines like anthropology, sociology, urban planning, etc., should be participating in public health education. Lastly, Greenberg suggests that schools of public health should educate public health leaders from emerging economies. From my understanding, this is not as widespread as it could be and a potential area for improvement for schools of public health. It is important that schools of public health change their structures because ensuring change doesn't just happen at the level of individual community and academic projects and partnerships and education, but the change needs to also happen at the systemic and institutional level in order for it to be sustainable. So next, let's talk a little bit about schools of public health as research institutions. So health equity, this is something we've talked a lot about, I'm sure in this class and in a lot of your other courses, health equity is focused on centering and elevating the voices and leadership of the communities most experiencing inequity. So although in recent times we hear health equity over and over again, an emphasis on health equity has not always been the focus of public health research and research specifically in schools of public health. So just some food for thought, health equity addresses some of these questions like who is included and excluded from research? Who represents the community? Who are the people in your research study? Who serves as the narrative shapers? Who determines how we establish facts and reach conclusions? How will the research enterprise support a culture that is inclusive, mutually respectful, and one that values and elevates community leadership? These are all questions related to health equity and the way that we structure and conduct our research and interact with research as part of an institution. To address health equity well in our work, we need trust. Trust impacts participation in research, it impacts the quality of the research, and it also impacts the outcomes that we're looking at. It impacts the participation in prevention and treatment seeking. Unfortunately, trust is hard to get, and there's a good reason. People distrust because of personal experiences with health systems, unequal access in healthcare, experiences of discrimination, 
a history of unethical biomedical research, and also miseducation. So let's talk about this in a little more depth. To be honest, research institutions have not earned the community's trust. This quote is from the Community Campus Partnerships for Health. They say that those of us who are at academic institutions must be honest with ourselves about how the academic research enterprise itself may contribute to deepening and widening health inequities and consider the ways that racism and other forms of oppression may be perpetuated in research and health institutions and practice. So as part of academic institutions, we have to realize that we're part of a longer history of perpetuating and creating health inequity and ignoring health disparities and think about how we are situated in that historical context and how to move forward from there. So the onus of change of trust and inequity must shift from the community to research institutions because it is ultimately not the community's fault that they don't trust us. These are just two examples of reasons why the community has not trusted researchers. On the left is this study about the Tuskegee experiment, which was conducted for 40 years by the U.S. Public Health Service. The research study began in the 1930s, just after the founding of the American Public Health Service, to see what happened when men with syphilis were left untreated. All study participants were African American men, and they were told that they were being treated for bad blood. But they were only given spinal taps, vitamins, tonics, and aspirins. After penicillin was shown to be a cure for syphilis in the 1940s, the men were left untreated and in the study until the exposure of the study in 1972. Another example of a study that was unethical occurred in Guatemala from 1946 to 1948. A researcher infected participants with STDs and observed them to see if penicillin could be a cure for different STDs. Participants were men and women who were prisoners, mental patients, soldiers, sex workers, and orphans. Groups that we would consider marginalized in society. Records from the study show that 1,308 people were inoculated with an STD and 83 died over the course of the study. The study was unpublished, but a manuscript was found in archives in 2003 and eventually brought to the public's attention. In 2011, Guatemala filed a lawsuit against the U.S. Now, there are requirements for IRB and consent processes, but there's still distrust of the medical community for good reason. In Brandon Scharf's report, they quote their participants. You don't know what they're giving you and what they're experimenting on you. They are very secretive. They say one thing and might do another. And this is also related to mistrust in the government as a whole, since these studies were reported by the U.S. government. Another unethical medical practice is helicopter research, which is when study teams descend on minority communities only when they need to study subjects and then leave once they have their data. I'm sure this is something you've seen in your practice and research thus far and that of other researchers. And this is a practice that we're really trying to break because by coming in and taking data from communities, we are treating communities as research subjects rather than as human beings that have agency. I just want to highlight this quote from a study that talks about distress in research participation. A participant says, it goes back if you find something. Are we ever going to see it? So truly, why does my participation really matter for anything? If it's not going to produce a product that I'm going to see, why should I be one of the study participants? So we see how this mistrust can actually impact the quality of our research and the quality of community engagement in our research. And there's empirical evidence for this. African Americans are more likely than whites to believe that research findings will be used to reinforce negative stereotypes about their ethnic group, which has been done in the past, or expose them to unnecessary risks, as we talked about has been done in the past. In addition, Participants have concerns that findings will not benefit their community, as we mentioned. Similarly, another study found that black participants were 1.8 times more likely than whites to have a higher fear of participation in biomedical research. So with all of this mistrust, it has a direct impact on our recruitment and representation in our research. African Americans are less likely to participate as research subjects 
when compared to non-Hispanic whites after adjusting for age, sex, education, and income. And as we know from our research methods class, having a non-representative sample can actually be detrimental to the interpretation and implications of our research. Lastly, this mistrust also has an impact on health disparities. The high levels of medical mistrust lead to an underutilization of healthcare. There's a study that took a random sample of households in New York City, Baltimore, Maryland, and San Juan, Puerto Rico. Hispanics compared to whites were 1.94 times more likely to report fear of being a guinea pig in research and 1.72 times more likely to lack trust in medical people and this will make them unwilling to participate in cancer screening. As we know, cancer screening is very important to early detection of cancer. In addition, those who are less educated, meaning had a less than a high school degree or were only high school graduates, were two times more likely to report a fear of being embarrassed compared to participants with a college degree. So as we know, there are wide disparities in healthcare utilization, and ultimately health outcomes. And today, if you even just look at the Healthy People 2020 goals, we are still way off in reducing health disparities between racial and ethnic groups. And part of this can be attributed to medical mistrust. Within the research setting, we tend to focus trust on the public's trust or distrust and changing their level of trust. But instead, we need to take more responsibility for needing to be more trustworthy and creating a culture that is inclusive and mutually respectful. So addressing medical mistrust needs to begin with a process of engagement on the part of the medical providers and the researchers, rather than expecting for communities to trust us off the back. Trust related to public involvement in more advanced research roles is more often related to fairness and communications and less related to competency and systems trust. Also, we need to think about what are the characteristics of trustworthy researchers, people that are empathetic, accessible, approachable, honest, respectful, attentive, humble. These are as important, if not more important, than the technical competence and prestige of the institution that you belong to. And some strategies that enhance trust build on the principles of community engagement, which includes balancing power dynamics, equitable distribution of resources, effective two-way communication, shared decision-making, and valuing different resources and assets. The goal of our trust building should be co-learning, and this will help increase trust. So just to reiterate, community members' trust is not about your expertise or your credentials. This is from the same study about medical mistrust where a participant says that the words are important, but it's also the way you present those words. Because they can say a lot of words, but if it's not presented correctly or with some kind of feeling that you have concern, just don't talk to me. So mistrust is not just about what qualifications you have, but it's also personal. So we need to ask ourselves, am I a trustworthy researcher? What obligations do I have in ensuring that the societal benefits of research are enjoyed by underserved communities? What strategies can I use to think about this in my work? Schools of public health need to reach for a higher standard of engagement and trust building. Right now, the status quo is informed consent, minimization of risk, and the equitable selection of research subjects, which has not really changed in the recent past. But we want to have a goal of cultivating the positive culture of research and practice, both within this institution, but also broadly in the scope of research. We need a new approach to do these things. We need to emphasize transparency in the work we do and asking ourselves, what are the social and political values that influence my methodology and hypotheses? Having values isn't a bad thing in and of itself, but it's important to recognize the values that influence your approach to your research. A new approach should also emphasize maximizing community benefit. This impacts your obligations as a researcher during and after research and this ultimately can impact your analyses and your methodologies. It also leads to asking questions about how or why a focus on differences in health by race or ethnicity could perpetuate stereotypes. Because an alternative to this is comparing groups against themselves and doing analyses within a strata of race. But if we're not focused on maximizing community benefit, then this approach may not necessarily be seen as the best one. 
We also might think about alternatives to helicopter research, which we talked about earlier. In changing how we do research, we demonstrate trustworthiness and also get a more in-depth understanding of the community and its needs, goals, and expectations. And there's a benefit for the researcher too. The benefit is more participation, more insightful analysis, and also a participant benefit of education and information about the research, and a community benefit with the infusion of resources and increased capacity. Lastly, this new approach should not just be about equitable distribution of benefits and burden, but also recognize group membership in the concepts of justice and what it means to be part of a specific group and how this impacts health. A study conducted by Jasani and colleagues about barriers and facilitators to engagement found a bunch of different factors related to community engagement and research. In this study, 52% of faculty said that academic incentives were a factor for community engagement and even more so for assistant professors. In addition, they also saw department culture was a factor for engagement, but more so for people who were in policy development and evaluation. Another commonly cited barrier was availability of dedicated time. And then lastly, institutional affiliation was also a fa facilitator of engagement. So here are some tips for building trust and community engagement and research, which I'm sure you'll talk about a lot more in this course. One tip is to establish a community advisory board to aid in study design, recruitment planning, and interpretation of findings. This is generally seen as a best practice, and there are a lot of professors here at UIC School of Public Health who have some kind of advisory board or committee that, to provide input on their research. Another tip is to work with minority investigators and people from the community that you are including in your research study. Another tip is to provide the study results in an accessible format that can be used by the community program for development or lobbying purposes. This is really important because traditionally academia does not value non-peer review publications. But more and more, researchers are putting out more infographics, white papers, and other kinds of resources that help describe the study results in formats that can be useful to community organizations and people that we work with in our research. Another tip is to support training that strengthens the ability of community members to be more effective collaborators and research staff in future projects. Again, there are a lot of professors doing this at the School of Public Health that provide resources for community members to be more involved in research and provide more useful feedback to your research. Another tip is to build grant application capacity among your community leaders so that they can pursue research or programmatic agendas that are considered important to them and relevant to their communities. This shifts some of the ownership for community research to the communities themselves rather than you as an external researcher. Another last tip is to support the existing infrastructure like clinics, churches, other community-based associations that can work to improve the health and welfare of the community. So perhaps in establishing your community advisory board, you can work within an existing infrastructure rather than creating something new that will dissolve as soon as the study's over. So with that, let's move into the second portion of this lecture about schools of public health as the trainer of public health professionals. As we talked about a little bit at the beginning of this lecture, there was an Institute of Medicine Future of the Public Health report that described schools of public health in a state of disarray. It said that schools of public health have in recent years become somewhat isolated from the field of public health practice. This is a problem because as trainers of public health professionals, that is, people that go into practice, schools of public health need to prepare those practitioners to be able to do their job well and integrate community engagement in their work. So let's take a look a little bit at the MPH competencies that are developed from the Council for Education and Public Health, which, as we said, was founded in the 1940s. I won't read through all of these competencies, but I want to highlight that the competencies emphasize both quantitative and qualitative methodologies. It emphasizes structural bias, social inequity, racism, population-based perspectives, and also skills related to community engagement and overall being able to work in partnership with both people on your team and off of your team. As we discussed, the Council for Education and Public Health 
was founded to provide a minimum standard for public health education, and these competencies are used to guide what it looks like for schools of public health to prepare public health professionals for their practice in the future. These competencies align well with the public health professional competencies, which is a consensus set of skills for the broad practice of public health, as defined by the 10 essential public health services, which you can look up on the CDC website. The public health professional competencies were developed by the Council on Linkages between Academic and Public Health Practice, and the core competencies reflect foundational skills that are desirable for professionals engaging in the practice, education, and research of public health. So as we think about the SEEF competencies for education of public health and the professional competencies, we want to see that these align. The analytical and assessment competency focuses on identifying and understanding data, turning data into information for action, assessing the needs and assets to address community health needs, developing community health assessments, and using evidence for decision making. The policy development and program planning competency emphasizes being able to determine needed policies and programs, advocating for policies and programs, planning, implementing, and evaluating, developing and implementing strategies for quality improvement, and lastly, developing and implementing community health improvement plans and strategic plans. The next competency is communication, which is important for assessing and addressing population literacy, soliciting and using community input, communicating data and information, facilitating communications, and communicating the roles of government, healthcare, and others. Cultural competency is a competency that relates to understanding and responding to the diverse needs of communities, being able to assess the organizational cultural diversity and competence, assessing the effects of policies and programs on different populations, and being able to take action to support a diverse public health workforce. Community dimensions of practice includes evaluating and developing linkages and relationships within the community, maintaining and advancing partnerships and community involvement, negotiating the use of community assets, defending public health policies and programs, and evaluating effectiveness and improving community engagement. The public health sciences is a competency essential for understanding the foundation and prominent events of public health, applying public sciences to practice critiquing and developing research, using evidence when developing policies and programs, and establishing academic partnerships. Financial planning and management is a competency that is important for engaging other government agencies that can address community health needs, leveraging public health and healthcare funding mechanisms, developing and defending budgets, motivating personnel, evaluating and improving program and organization performance, and establishing and using performance management systems to improve organization performance. Lastly, leadership and systems thinking is a competency important for incorporating ethical standards into the organization, creating opportunities for collaboration among public health, healthcare, and other organizations, mentoring personnel, adjusting practice to address changing needs and the environment, ensuring continuous quality improvement, managing organizational change, and advocating for the role of governmental public health. So it's expected that public health professionals can meet a wide range of competencies, and public health education is supposed to provide a basis from which graduates of the programs can build up these competencies as they progress throughout their careers. A way that we can think about doing this a little more intentionally in our public health teaching is through critical service learning. Critical service learning aims for a level of social change that reflects social justice. While still predicated on the development of authentic partnerships, critical service learning diverges from traditional service learning. Because it aims for social change, it also aims for understanding power as well as the need to redistribute power rather than simply for civic engagement. In this, we can think about how the principles of community engagement can directly affect the way that we learn and the way that professors teach. In critical service learning, through authentic partnerships, participants work together to analyze power, build coalitions, and develop empathy. When you think about how you have engaged in public health practice thus far in your program, would you characterize any of the activities you've done as critical service learning? In this context, I want to introduce the Collaboratory for Health Justice. Our mission is to support 
community academic partnerships by facilitating the meaningful participation of broad stakeholders represented in this stakeholder map on the right. In particular, we want to attend to representation and presence, which is one of the important aspects of trust that we talked about earlier in this lecture. In doing this, we want to provide training and technical assistance for integrating community engagement across research, teaching, and practice. And this includes providing this assistance, not just for faculty and researchers, but also for students and future public health professionals. In doing all of this, our vision is health justice attained through active participation of broad stakeholders in the academy through research, teaching, and practice. The vision for the Collaboratory for Health Justice grew out of the School of Public Health Strategic Plan, which emphasizes community engagement. In our landscape assessment, we heard that there are a lot of challenges to being a good partner, even just for researchers. So we imagine that there are many challenges for students who are learning how to do community engagement. Our current focus areas for the collaboratory are supporting partner representation and school public health presence in the community. In examining this, we also focus on representation and reciprocity in our community engagement thinking about trust building and co-learning as we talked about earlier. We are also focused on developing resources for scholarly community engagement and critical service learning to go beyond the status quo and think more thoughtfully about building trust and having meaningful engagement in all that we do as public health professionals and researchers. So far, we are working on developing best practice and how-to documents. Some examples of what we've produced so far include sample MOUs, agreements with community organizations, and budgets, which are very essential for grant applications. We're also working on developing IRB resources to think about how we can integrate trust and going beyond the status quo in the bare minimum set by the IRB. In addition, we want to emphasize that there is a lot of scholarly work that happens that is not considered research. We want to provide guidance for students and traditional researchers to do the determination that this is not research process. Another thing that we are working on developing is a YouTube channel that will be accessible not just to people within the School of Public Health, but also community members. This is a way that we can think about maximizing community benefit in all the work that we do. Right now we have a set of qualitative modules on our YouTube channel and we plan to develop more modules related to scholarly community engagement, highlighting the work of researchers and practitioners within the School of Public Health and the work of our partners. Another resource for community engagement and learning community engagement is providing swag and being able to thank our community partners. In doing this, we hope to create a culture that is more friendly towards professors who want to invite community partners to present in their class and providing some kind of incentive for doing so, and also resources to ensure that partnerships continue to be reciprocal and beneficial for both parties. We're in a process of building resources for critical service learning. We want to match student skills with partner needs. There are many community-based organizations who may not have a dedicated staff member to do evaluation or data analysis, for example. With this being one of the foci of public health education, we want to match the skills that students are learning with needs of partners. And this will be a mutually beneficial arrangement between community partners and students who want to perfect their skill. We also want to create training opportunities for students to become competent in skills partner needs. For example, focus group facilitation. We want to foster an environment where students, faculty, and staff can work together. As we know, collaboration within the School of Public Health is very common. We want to make it easier for students to become involved in ongoing projects, but also have meaningful participation and ownership over the pieces of the project they're doing. We also want to provide resources for lab managers to better integrate learning and mentorship into their lab groups. Lastly, we want to create an overall structure and a culture within the School of Public Health for all of these activities to occur. Right now, everything is very siloed, as you may have noticed, and we want to make it easier for everyone to be involved and for everyone to better engage with the community. 
By creating a dedicated space to house all these activities, we hope that more people would seek out ways to integrate community engagement and we would provide resources for that to be possible. This wraps up the lecture portion of our course. You were sent out a list of discussion and activities for this week. I encourage you to take a look at that and good luck. Here are some references and if you have any questions, concerns, or ideas, you can email me at agrant23 at uic.edu. Thank you.